Hello, it's Wayne Hiley with Peninsula Energy. I'm Managing Director and CEO. Peninsula has been on a journey um, to improve its technical um, aspects for the Lance Project in Wyoming. We've been doing some field demonstration work. And recently, uh, we've come to the market with news that we've accelerated the field demonstration and concluded that effort. And that brings this company a lot closer to being um, ready for the return to production at Lance when the markets are ready. So uh, Peninsula Energy today is um, well-funded. We have contracts which uh, continue, uh, we continue to serve and, and generate cash revenue for the company. And um, we're looking forward to discussing these field demonstration uh, developments in particular with the audience today. Which is quite handy because that's why I called you. I wanted to understand um, a little bit about the journey that you went on with that. Okay. Cause you know, when we first, first started speaking, you had a technical problem to solve, right? And part one of the things you needed to do was were these um, field demonstrations, right? You did, however, make an announcement a few months ago that you needed a six months extension to that, got people a little bit nervous. And then the next thing you go and do is deliver within the original time frame. Well, that's right. We did uh, look. Uh, we were very cautious when we when we guide to the market. Um, we guided that the uh, field demonstration was going to take longer based on these larger scale patterns that we were operating the field demonstration under. Uh, we recognized um, along the way, though, that if we if we contracted the patterns, if we made smaller patterns, we could get the same data that we were looking for in a much shorter time frame. So we set about that. We recognized uh, the uranium markets have been shifting and improving, and the and that the time to market is going to is going to be critical for any company. So so we adjusted our field demonstration pattern sizes. We processed the volumes a lot quicker. And we were able to obtain data that will be valuable for us in reassessing our technical assumptions for um, a, an updated feasibility study in the future. Uh, but the main thing was initially we said, you know, given the path we're on, it's going to take a little longer. Uh, we changed the path rather than staying on the path, Matt. And, and, and because we changed the path, we were able to deliver the results that we needed a lot quicker and come to the market and share now that we've concluded the field demonstration. What was the problem you're trying to solve there? I mean, we originally talked about low pH solutions, and now this is a question of, well, what's the recovery grade or the potential recovery grade for you? I mean, what did you get out of it? Well, you know, in the laboratory, you're using uh, column testing and, and very discrete samples of uranium, uh, and you can get a lot of information about uranium grade potentials and, and such, but there's no substitute for doing in the field uh, what you will be doing in the field as a commercial operation. So for us, it was uh, demonstrate that the chemistry really works, demonstrate that the pattern configurations that we have in mind would work. And that's where we had to actually make some adjustments. And then we also had some other technical, some plant technical things, how we were going to manage solids for, you know, that are generated um, when we, when we bring the pH down, how are we going to, uh, you know, deal with the limitations of ion exchange in the recovery plant. You know, so we've done a lot of technical innovation. We've done a lot of uh, testing of, of concepts and proving of concepts uh, so that when we do um, go into commercial operations, um, this field demonstration is going to help us put our best foot forward. Right. But people kind of, people want to understand whether you're going to be able to, um, extract uranium economically. So what data here feeds into those sorts of reports where you, and, and also what would the timing of any of those reports be for you be able to say to the market, do you know what? Not only have we solved the problem technically, and we've, you know, I think you've talked about peak recovery grades of 150 ppm in there, um, but, but people are going to want to sense around the economics. So, so what's the, what's the path or process to being able to talk, you know, talk that language? Yeah, you bet. Well, look, we looked at um, actual field consumption um, rates for, for acid, which is one of the cost drivers for the low pH. Uh, you know, we looked at pattern configurations and how that impacts acid uh, consumption. 
We looked at pattern configuration sizes and, and how it impacts the rate of recovery from the field. So we've taken uh, and, and, and obtained some very real and very useful data using, uh, by the field demonstration. And the economic question is the next one for us to answer. Uh, we are taking that data, we're, we're looking at it, we're preparing the data and technical assumptions to enter that into an updated feasibility study, which I'd imagine will launch in, in early 2022. Okay, interesting. Would you mind sharing this? Because we, we, we saw in the press release a um, couple of little diagrams, and, and, I'm, and just for some people who kind of like to get into the technical aspect, because most people go, oh, yeah, I, I understand what ISR is. They don't. They just understand what the what the the letters stand for typically. So, if, are you able to maybe talk us through where you were and then what you decided to do with these kind of closed space patterns and um, and and how you lay laid that out? Is that something we could talk about today? Certainly. Well, um, you know, the distance between the injection well and the recovery well in in situ recovery is really important. It determines what rate you can recover a pore volume, which is which is the effective effective amount of solution in the pattern. You know, the distance between um, an injection well and a recovery well uh, determines how much volume you have to address. Now, generally speaking, we can address the volume at the same rate, say 20 or 25 gallons per minute. So if it's a large val volume, it takes a long time at 25 gallons a minute to address the whole volume. We shrunk the pattern size down uh, to a small volume and we continued to process at the same rate so we could achieve more volumes uh, quicker, more rapidly. Uh, and that's really what we did with this, with the small pattern sizes, we were able to, to do 25 poor volumes, affected volumes of a small pattern in a very short period of time, where when we started out, we were, we were addressing a poor volume of the large patterns in, you know, essentially two months time. So if we had stayed on that pace to get to 25 poor volumes, you're talking about several years. And, and as a test goes, that's not a very effective test. But it's also important to keep in mind in, in when you establish patterns, it's easier to go from large patterns to small patterns uh, you know, by shrinking the size. When we activated the small pattern within the large pattern, it had already been acidified. It had already seen production solutions. So it, it responded very quickly and it responded very well, um, you know, as a small pattern would. We were able to see the entire um, recovery curve. It matches nicely our assumptions from the laboratory. And that's what a field demonstration is about, demonstrating that the technical ideas that you have are good ones. It's interesting when you know when we talk to geologists and um, they, they're moving into into uh, drilling we, we, inside this site. I should say in, with regards to oil recovery, right? Oil, oil and gas mm -hmm. recovery. They need to manage the field. You guys do here too. Obviously, go, you know, if you're digging for gold, it's you know you're going right. I'm going I'm to dig for gold, and, and there it is, and we can sort of see see with high grade stuff where it, where it tends to go to. Likewise, for you, you're talking about the the, the flow of liquids. Through your field, and you, you're trying to manage that. So I'm trying to I'm trying to um, compute and understand the way that these these smaller closed patterns, by understanding each one of those, you can sort of see how they join up or how they'll behave when you do something, you know, f you know, f further further, you know, out. Is that, I mean, I, I, is that what it is? Is it some sort of like sort of organic yeah. jigsaw puzzle of? Trying to work out where the pieces will be when you make a when you make a move. Yes, and and I think too that that you know using a small pattern does you know to to achieve the test objective doesn't mean that we'll use that that size of pattern in the future. It's a pilot. Uh, you know, consider it like a pilot scale test. Every pilot scale is a much smaller scale test than what's actually commercialized. Um, we went from a pattern that was larger than anything that we had ever used before at our site. Um, then we reduced it in size um, to something smaller than we've ever done before. 
smaller is, is, does not mean that, that, that we have to use that size in the future. What it means is that that size has given us the field data that we need um, to, to make the technical uh, demonstrations that we wanted to make. Uh, it, it's so much different than, you know, somebody who's trying to prove a resource, you know, Peninsula Energy has been focused on optimizing and improving its production capabilities. We're a different company in many ways to, to the folks that you talk to, most of the folks that you talk to. Yeah, no, no, I understand that from our, pre, from our previous conversations here. What I'm, what I'm trying to um, work out is what, what does this say to the market? You know, you see what's happening in the uranium space at the moment. People are getting a little bit excited. It's it's kind of fallen away towards the end of this year because people are slightly distracted with you know tax loss season and waiting to see what Sput does next. Um, I, I I suspect a large degree, but you know you guys have seen great gains this year. You you certainly have, along with many of your peers. Um, is you've got to play into the market that's coming. You're a US Wyoming based. Uranium producer, ASX company, but nevertheless, US uranium. How does this work feed into that narrative for you know, um, you know, US market? We, talk, we talked about uranium, US reserve. Uh, we've talked about US companies, um, you know, fitting into you know, uh, US equities, uh, so uh, utilities, I should say. <laughs> That story hasn't kind of gone away. You, 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 this information says we are going to be a producer. We'll come back and let you know about the economics shortly. But you know that's a question of you know what price do we need? Well, spot price or contract? Absolutely. Be, right? Matt, I, I think the accelerated conclusion of the field demonstration shows to the market Peninsula's intention to aggressively move after uh, production. We anticipate that 2022 is going to be a very good year in the uranium space. We need to be prepared to be a producer. We need to put our project back online and we need to advance the, you know, the feasibility study and the final economic uh, piece uh, as quickly as possible and aggressively as possible in 2022 so that we can meet the market demands that we foresee um, at, as they continue to grow in 2022 and 2023. If you have uranium in your name and you can't produce uranium, you can't profit from the up market. That's a conversation for a whole other time. But you know, companies talking about uranium but not actually able to produce uranium, that's a conversation for another time. I want, I want, I want to focus in on this one, okay? So these field tests, Allow you to accelerate into the economics. Okay. You talked about, you know, starting the process in 2022, but how quickly can you move through? I mean, just how important were these field tests to your ability to quickly move through the economic study phase? Well, we did learn from the field demonstration and, and that field, and that learning means that we're going to reassess some capital needs, some operating costs. And we're going to put that into you know the complete economic picture, economic projections of of a feasibility study in the near term. But we have to go out and and you know scope out what those capital costs are so that we have a quality economic study. Uh, we're very deliberate. Um, you know we're going to make decisions based on good information. We're not going to make uh, decisions in haste based on half of the information that we need. So, so this company now, um, we've, we've hired uh, a person who's um, been very expert and, and proficient at preparing uh, feasibility study, economics, and engineering uh, works. Um, Mr. Pyle. Mr. Brian Pyle yeah. uh, has, has come on board with us here in November very timely addition because, um, you know, he will be taking that data. He will be uh, going out and getting, um, you know, the cost information that we need. Um, he's done this multiple times as a consultant in the industry, and he's also worked in the industry in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Kazakhstan uh, in in situ recovery facilities. So he's a very experienced uh, industry veteran who has uh, a portfolio of, of feasibility study um, uh, analysis under his belt. He's very capable to, to take the modeling that we need and, and, and putting it into the shape that, that we need to make good decisions as a company. 
Well, I, I like I see. I like what you've done here because t- today we we hired someone um, called Paul Webb to look after our internet, and you, you, you've hired Brian Pyle and also Ken Mc, uh, Millmine as well. So I, I, I like that. It's good. There's a symmetry to that. Um, <laughs> you bet. Well, you know, in order to move forward rapidly, we needed the right talent in place. And we were, we were lucky to be able to attract that talent to this company. And they recognize that, that um, we're moving in that direction. It's a very exciting time for Peninsula. We're growing. We're, we're expanding. We're getting ready. You are. You are. My question to you was, how quickly can you do that? Because, look, ISR is one of the, the sort of the cheaper capex type uranium place, right? Uh, so we're not expecting you to walk back and say our capex programs are four hundred million. Um, far from it. We're expecting you to come in with a kind of low capex. You've sorted out the balance sheet. Was that beginning of this year? Or was the end of last year? I can't can't remember the timing of the the raise. When was that beginning of this year? Right. Well, we did we did a capital raise mid year. Um, which we used to, to purchase about 300,000 pounds of uranium. I was talking um, about the wiping out of debt. Oh, that was that was actually uh, about a year and a half ago already. Oh, my goodness. Time flies. Time flies. Whoa, I'm getting old. Our, our balance sheet, Matt, is strong right now. That's, we have, um, I understand that. You know, we, we closed the last quarter at about $8 million. Uh, you know, we had some inflows from some, from some sales subsequent to that which improved our cash position. And on top of that, we have a uranium inventory of over 300,000 pounds, presently valued at 13, 14 million dollars. It gives us a lot of flexibility in moving forward. Um, you know, we do need some funds to, to bring the project back onto production, to build some new well fields, to do the transition from alkaline to low pH. Uh, all of that's going to be done pretty quickly. You know, we've been guiding that we could do it in about a six month time frame from an investment decision to have the project starting back into production and ramping up. Right. Let's so let's 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 go there if you don't mind, because I you know what you don't want is a bunch of shareholders nervous that you're going to dilate the heck out of them. Right. So t- the timing of the market and your expectations for 2022, 2023, in terms of you know what's going to happen there, are important as to how. You play this because the your time frame to making an FID is 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 what? Well, you know, I, I think it's important for for our shareholders to recognize that first of all that that um, the commercial deliveries of uranium that we have scheduled for 2022 are covered with purchases. So, um, you know, we don't have under our present contract portfolio the need to produce in 2022. But I believe that um, we should be making that investment decision and putting our project in into a state of readiness um, in 2022 so that we can be feeding pounds into the market in 2023. Perfect. Understood. And I, I think that's really, really important because then that kind of feeds the next um, thought, which is if the, mar- if the price in the market is ready and where you feel you need it to be to not just economically, but obviously um, extract uranium, but also make a reasonable profit, and you need margin, the name of the game is to make money, right? Is, um, do you think that would be at the, the FID would be at the point where you felt that you could go and get not just cheap money, but stack up on the debt because you'll have contracts in place? I know you've already got contract contracts in place, but do you need additional contracts in place? to kind of um, benefit from whatever debt may be available to you? I think the contracts that we have in place would, would uh, be adequate if we, if we, follow, if we followed a, a debt model. Um, we certainly have a lot of flexibility right now. We're sitting on a reasonable amount of cash and inventory, which could be liquidated. Um, you know, the decision isn't going to be made with the market at its present level. Um, and, you know, which means that, it, you know, when the when the decision uh, to reinvest in the project uh, is made, uh, I believe we'll be in a in a better or more improved uh, uranium market. And and uh, there should be good demand for our shares and and for the activities that that we're pursuing. We'd be raising capital to put a project into production if we do decide to use an equity raise model. Right. This is, this is the bit that intrigues me. It always has done when, you know, when I was in banking. It was, it was a case of you know, what confidence did we as bankers have 
about the thematic, this case uranium, because the recovery will have been short, not not yet long lived. So you've got to factor in that you know moving averages and all of that sort of stuff, and the company's competence and ability to actually actually produce. Right. So I guess you're going to say number two tick. Number one, with regards to certainty, even with contracts in place, or could you say, do those contracts give you certainty so that me as a banker would say, do you know what, irrespective of what the the price of the market does, um, the spot price does, I have got fixed price contracts in place. I don't know what the, the average number is in terms of the remaining contracts for you, but that gives us a profit and therefore you as bankers should feel comfortable about that. Now, our, our contracts have uh, fixed prices that are, that are going to be above $50 a pound and they extend out to the year 2030, which should give a great deal of confidence to any lender. Um, and I think that um, as a company, you know, we'd hope to um, secure additional contracts um, so that we can ramp up our project to higher production rates over time. Uh, but I think it's it's a it's a balance between watching a rising market and you know pulling the trigger and and um, you know making sure that you have the the economic base, the the revenue base that you need to to secure. Uh, the funding that you want. Right. And the, and there's production and then there's production in the sense that just getting into production to be able to say to utilities, hey, look, we told you we could do it technically, right? And But you're not mm-hmm. producing a lot. So there's some, there's some pros there because we're in production. But in terms of saying, hey, we can be producing a million, you know, you know, a million pounds a year, that's, that's another conversation entirely. Right. So yeah. you, my view, how do you my play view, that? Matt, is that the utilities want to contract with established producers. Uh, they they will contract when when they must with um, producers that you know wish to go into production or hope for, hope to be in production. But the bottom line is the utilities are looking for the established producers to contract with. So if you want to be in that camp, if you want to be an established producer, the first step is to produce. Okay. So go, go, go early, ramp up. Yeah. And, and use that forward momentum, do it systematically and, and, and sensibly, you know, it, it, I don't think it's possible to, to contract um, an entire mines production um, into this market uh, without first having for, without first being in production. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. And it does come back to early conversation. I know it's, I said a conversation for another day, but just for, very very briefly, there there are a lot of CEOs who perhaps are gonna, are going to feel the the, the you know, if the market does move as expected next year, they're going to actually have to go and do something. They're going to have to show that they can get into production. They are going to have to go and put the money together to show that they they they, they can do this economically too. Um, and there are going to be some capable of, of, of doing that. And they'll, you know, they'll wiggle their way towards the end at the destination. But the others that will kind of maybe fall over. Is that is that a sort of demonstration of the the sentiment momentum play versus the, I guess, the old hands? Um, and because you know, a few people like yourself who've been there and done it before are quite keen to tell me that it's harder than it looks. It, it is harder than it looks, and and that's one of the reasons why we did a field demonstration. Uh, we're checking off that technical risk now. You know, we checked off the regulatory risk, we checked off the technical risk, and you know, we've positioned this company really strongly to be prepared for for you know financing the resumption of production. Uh, you know, the lenders are going to want to know that the technical risk is low. That's why we do something like a field demonstration. We're we're leaps and bounds ahead of the people who you know have a permitted project but haven't built a thing, or or haven't operated a thing. Uh, we have a built facility that needs some modifications. We've tested what those modifications will will perform like, and and we've really taken off the technical risks. Okay, interesting days ahead. Um, Wayne, thank you for kind of breaking down. We'll put a maybe put a use the, the model that you've um, put in the press release up while you were talking about it, just to sort of you know show people what you you, you will 
visual picture paints a thousand words, right? Uh, yes, so we'll, yes. we'll, we'll do that. Um, but also looking Perfect. forward to sort of seeing how this plays out in, in the new year. I think there's great expectations um, around some of the financial players in the space stepping mm -hmm. up, um, and also with obviously, uh, I think split listing at NYSE should be should be an interesting moment to sort of see what the U.S. market then does for various uranium companies in North America. Thank you for your time today. You bet. I, uh, Matt, 2022, it's right around the corner. It's a year to look forward to if you're a uranium investor. 2021 was a good year, uh, but it was just building the foundation, just like Peninsula has been building its foundations. 2022, the uranium market looks to be uh, you know, tremendously well uh, set for a good run. Uh, Peninsula has been positioning itself uh, to run with the market so thank you for your time.